Seminoles here in Florida, there were native people living on this land. Um, we didn't call it Florida, that's a name the Spanish called it. Um, in my tribe, the Creek Indians, we say Igana, it means the earth. And in this part of the earth, here's what the tribes were before the arrival of the Spanish. So, I'll show you what these tribes were. And if you look closely, you'll see where the word Miami comes from, right where Lake Okeechobee is. That was the name of a tribe. And that was actually the name of the lake before we call it Okeechobee. That's a seminal name for that lake, okay? But the old tribes had their own names for it. And you can see on this map, there are no Seminoles. In this area, you see where the name Ocali, that's where the word Ocala comes from. They were part of a group of the Kamukla people. The <laughs> And so these were the old tribes of Florida, the Calusa, the Apalachee, the Cuesta, Aes, Jaga, Ocali, Muqua. And they didn't dress at all like I'm dressed. In their time, everything they had just came from nature, what nature gives us. And so today I want to talk to you for a few minutes and explain to you how people lived off of only what nature had, how the old tribes survived. And then we'll talk a little bit about the Seminoles and, and how we came to this, okay? So, first of all, these tribes had just what nature gave them, and so they used those things. A lot of their food was seafood because they lived by waters. We have seafood all around us. And so shellfish, when you eat your food, the shells become either made into a jewelry or a beads by using a pump drill. Can you guys say pump drill? Pump, pump drill. drill. Yeah, pump drill works. <laughs> I push down, it spins back and forth. And that's how we drilled those out. But a lot of times those shells would get piled up in a pile. And as time goes on, the pile gets giant sized until we find the middens and mounds today. And that's the evidence of native people's existence here for thousands of years before Columbus. We called ourselves by the names of our tribe, not Indians. That's the name Columbus gave us, because I guess he thought he was an Indian. Another guy came named Ponce de Leon. And after a couple trips here and capturing natives as slaves and trying to find gold and fountains of youth, he met the Calusa. And they didn't waste any time trying to be his friend. They'd already heard rumors of these strangers coming and capturing natives as slaves. And so they attacked his ships from the beach and he was wounded by one of their poisoned arrows, which he later died from back in Cuba, Ponce de Leon, the namer of Florida. This is a weapon like the Calusa would have had. The original one was found in an archaeological site down near Naples, but this was made from what they had found, a war club with shark's teeth and the glue made from the sap of a tree, pine pitch glue. And so the Calusa, fierce tribe. And so this table represents people living in those days, not just the Calusa, even here the Ocali. Up here they were more farmers instead of fishing. These are what our farming tools look like thousands of years ago. And many of the foods that you'll eat today are foods that native people have taught the rest of the world. Corn, beans, squash, potatoes, pumpkins, sunflowers, strawberries, blueberries, grapes, peppers, avocados, tomatoes, even chocolate is food that comes from native people. And so yes, we were farmers. No, we didn't grow chocolate in this area. But not far from here was a village called Ahapapka. That means place where we grow the potatoes. 
corn, beans, and squash was one of our main crops in the eastern United States. And because native tribes are farmers, they don't move around. Tribes of Florida, tribes of the eastern United States never ever lived in a teepee. That's out west on the prairie. In the Creek and Seminole language, we say house like this, say Chico or Chiqui. And that is how you say house nowadays to them. And even the old tribes, like the Tamuqua, who lived in this area, their word for house, say it with me, ha ha. And that is how you, actually how you say my name, sawgrass. Ha ha glosli, which means the tall grass, the swamp, it's sharp like the blades of a grass, or blades of a saw. And so their word for house was grass. Now I'm sorry to tell you folks this, but this shade tree is not really a tree at all. That is a grass right there. It is in the grass family. But our state think it's a tree, so they made it our state tree. <laughs> but it's really grass. Trees have rings. That has no rings. It has fibers of grass. And so that is their word for house, and that is what they use for the roof of their house. Those leaves of those palm trees. The biggest ones that they could find. They would take those roofs, and they would build them by rows. They would take a strip of palm frond from each side, twist it, pull it around and tie it. No nails needed. And then they would do a row, and then another row, and the whole roof would be covered. And done correctly, this roof won't lay, it'll last for many, many years. You can see a small example of a hut or chicky right there through the woods. But some of our huts were giant sized, big enough for all of us to get inside of. In some of our ancient villages, we had giant huts where ceremonies could be done and, and things could happen even in the rainy days. A lot of our huts were left open on the bottom to allow the fresh air inside. Some of them had walls made of wattled and daub. That would be sticks woven, mud and clay would be plastered to dry like cement. Fire pits inside, smoke holes at the top. Tribes of the east didn't move around. They were farmers. We again, we were fishermen. So let's show you a couple of the fishing equipment that I've got here today. This first one you're going to see is the trap made from grapevine. Very easy to make. This has a funnel set up to where the fish swim inside, <coughs> sharp spikes looking in, facing inward, keep the fish from coming out the hole. The inside basket can be opened up by untying it and dump out your fish. This would be set in a river, a small creek, and then they would build walls using rocks or stones, and they would guide the fish right into the trap. They would, children sometimes would get up river and start playing and move down river, chasing the fish, and all along it's guiding them right into traps or little pools where spearmen would be waiting with their spears. This gig is set up to come apart. If I'm standing in a canoe and I see a garfish swim by or a mudfish or maybe a, a bass, I can gig him. And as soon as I do, this will stick into the fish and come off and he'll take off swimming away. This is a caught that fish, he can't get off unless I yank on it, he might rip it loose. So I'm gonna let him keep swimming. And he's gonna tote this around for a while, this float. And when it stops moving in the water, I know he's too tired to fight and then I'll pull in my fish. So this spear is made to come apart. We also made hooks, fish hooks. We made them out of bones, we made them out of shells, and probably out of some flint rocks too. Here's a fish hook carved out of a toe bone of a deer. The hook is weighted down with a weight made of shell. A corn cob acts as a float. This end we wouldn't have on a pole, we would tie it to a tree branch and leave it there and have another one down there, another one over there, maybe 20 of them on the river at the same time. The string is made from a grass that grows in the woods around here. Everybody say yucca. 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 You don't want to eat it. it tastes kind of yucca. <laughs> but it makes awesome rope. And that's how we made a fishing net. A fish net would have been made of yucca. That's rope made out of yucca. That's a pocket made out of yucca for storing stuff. So yucca is a fiber. And so we would make our hooks, our spears, our nets, our traps for fishing. We're also hunters. We killed animals. It wasn't to be mean, it was so we could live and survive. Long before our hunters would leave our villages and hunt the deer or the animals, dances and prayers and ceremonies were conducted to honor the animals we're going to kill. 
we would not waste the animals because everything from them can allow us to survive and that's why we killed them so we didn't just take the meat every bit of the animal got used any hunter got caught wasting something others would think that bad things might happen to his family later on and so we wouldn't do that and so when we killed the animals we used all of them the animal skin becomes our leathers that's where leather comes from is animal skins we would take the brains of the deer mixed with water and use it as a paste to rub into the hide. The animal brain has tannin in it, and the tannin is where the word tanning the hide comes from. So when someone says, I'm tanning a hide, it don't mean lay out in the sun and rub suntan lotion on you like you're about to do. It means to make leather. Or maybe it means to get a whipping. Anyways, tanning a hide, making leather. This is the softest leather you ever get to touch. I'm going to leave it here till the end of the program. At the end, you can come up and feel how soft that is. Brain tan. We can also take that same leather and dry it in the hot sun, make rawhide. Today, you would know this as a dog's chew bone. Mm -hmm. You might buy for a dog at the store. Unroll it, but when it's wet and it opens right up, it's usually a piece of rawhide. This would be a skin just dried out. Now, it could be used for making a drum, the bottoms of our shoes, or maybe we're going to cut it up into strips and we're going to lace make lacing out of it used to tie things together like that tomahawk there or maybe to tie together uh, this hammer okay and so we might take that raw hide and make pouches with it filled with sand and make ropes and now we have weapons that we can throw made out of that raw hide these kind of weapons were used by people all over the world not just South America okay Let's see some more. You guys want to see some more? Yeah. I might want to take that deer's fat that I scraped off his skin and use it for oil for cooking, oil for lotion to keep insects, oils for uh, candles, like this one is a candle made of deer fat. I can take the hair of that deer, make a headdress with it. I can leave the hair on and make a rug like that one you see there. I can take the deer's antlers and it would be used to chip rocks, to break rocks, to shape rocks, to make arrowheads. And by the time of the Seminoles, they weren't doing much of this at all anymore. This, if you find an arrowhead in your yard, most likely it wasn't from the Seminoles. By their time, they had the metal tools. They had the guns. And very few metal things, uh, arrowheads would have been one of the easiest things to get. So, but not made out of rocks. Rock ones were earlier tribes usually, okay? But using an antler to nap out an arrowhead. I might take that deer's tendons of his body, and I might use it as string to tie things together. That is how my arrows are tied together. That is how this scraping tool, or how about these knives? They're tied together with sinew. The big one is a deer antler for a handle and a blade chipped out of flint rock. The small one is an alligator's jawbone and a blade chipped out of flint rock. And they're tied with the tendons of the deer's leg. And so this is what knives would look like to the earlier tribes of Florida before the Seminoles. And so everything they had from nature, they used. The deer's toenails, I'll boil them in water till they melt into glue. That's how glue was made. Fish skins, hooves, horns. We could also use them for noisemakers in our dancing, okay, by wearing these on our legs as we dance. Sometimes turtle shells were used as rattles as well. How about the toe bone that's inside the deer's toenail? perfectly shaped to be used as an arrowhead. And even a shark's tooth in Florida would not be an uncommon arrowhead. And so the earlier tribes of, of this land used everything that nature gave them. Imagine eating lunch today and having a turtle shell for a plate and a drinking cup made of a seashell. Everybody say pottery. Pottery. Some of the oldest clay cooking pots found in the United States are found here in Florida. The tribes here had learned it earlier. They probably learned it from tribes of South America. No one knows for sure, but through trade, we had connections with each other, and we did trade things with each other. Copper, one of the only metals that native people had before the Europeans, was traded out of the Great Lakes in nuggets. And when it reached the south, they pounded them out, and they made all kinds of things with them. Headdress ornaments and ear spools, arrowheads. Taking clay, shaping, drying, making our cooking pots using the fibers of nature to weave, to make baskets, to make mats to sit on, to make sails for boats, to make ropes. This is the bark of a cypress tree 
made into a piece of rope. This is Spanish moss from the trees. We boiled it, killed the red bugs, dried it back out, and then we used it for bedding, and we also made rope with it. And early explorers talk about the earlier tribes of Florida wearing clothing even made out of Spanish moss. Make sure you boil it first, though. Yeah. Good way to get the chiggers. Every bit of those animals got used, even their guts. We use the deer's guts for bait to catch alligators with. See the alligator? I have his tail made into a quiver to hold my arrows. I have his foot made into a pouch to put stuff in. What's in your wallet? <laughs> I have his teeth from a giant alligator here around my neck. And so we would use the animal's claws and teeth and things like that for uh, jewelry and things like that. The earrings I'm wearing today are from the bear. Can you all say nokos? Nokos. The bear. His skin would be used for warmth. And a lot of times bears were hunted mainly for their fat. Not that we would throw everything else away, but bear fat was how we got oil for cooking. And nowadays we use bacon. There was no bacon. Pigs, cows, chickens, horses, goats. Those animals were brought by Europeans. We didn't know what a cow was. We had the buffalo. Can y'all say Yanusa? That's how my tribe says a buffalo. And so the bear, the buffalo, the deer, the three main hunted animals. The weapons in the earliest days were simple sticks for beating and stabbing. That was what the first spears looked like. And then people learned to add things to spears and make them better. And spears were used for running up and stabbing the animals, the big woolly mammoth, not the way I'm dressed. If you were to see a Seminole out there holding something like this, it wouldn't be authentic at all. We had guns, why would I wanna use this, okay? And so this was a stabbing spear and it goes back to paleo people hunting the big animals. And then one day people learned to throw a spear. And after they learned to throw a spear, they stopped making it big, heavy, and giant. And they started making it better for flying in the sky. And so lightweight cane, feathers that come off, oh, I'm sorry, feathers that make the arrow fly straight. And this are curved, which makes the arrow spin, and an arrowhead made for coming off. So when that hits the animal, it sticks him, this falls on the ground, hunters can pick it up, reload it, and use it again. Same thing with the stabbing spear. It was made to come apart. You can stab the animal, retreat, and reload. If I use a stick, if I use my hand to throw an arrow, it won't go real far. But if I use a stick called an addle addle, which is a throwing stick, it can make my arm very long and it can make the arrow go really far. And I don't have mine out today, but it's a stick about this long with a hook for my fingers and the hook on the end of the stick goes up here and it holds the arrow. So when I throw, it extends out and makes my arm longer. Using my hand to throw, I would only make it to that lady up there, watch. <laughs> Using an addle addle, I could throw it over top of the flag, okay? Now the next invention of man was when they learned to take the addle addle and flex it and make it bend. And we came up with this. And this goes into an era about 6,000 years ago called the Woodland Period. And during the Woodland Period, Native Americans become more farmers than anything else. They stopped hunting the big animals because they'd become extinct from the Ice Age. And when the Ice Age recedes, um, Florida gets much smaller. If you were to go into the Gulf of Mexico right now, 50 miles off of Tallahassee, you'll find underwater Native American Indian villages. Because back then, Florida was much bigger with the Ice Age. And once the ice melted, it got smaller. Of course, those are underwater today. And that's how they got there. The bow goes back to about 6,000 years ago. Of course, the arrows are not gonna be small. They're, I mean, big, they're gonna be small, like this. And we're gonna stop making arrowheads come off we tie them together. And so the bow becomes the new weapon. 500 years ago, as Europeans marched through this land, the earlier tribes of Florida are devastated. First, it's very scary. We don't know who these men are. We cannot speak their language. They cannot speak our language. And that would be like me saying something like that to you. You wouldn't know what I'm saying. I said, my name is Sawgrass. And so, um, these old tribes caught diseases they had no medicines for. Their bodies were not used to. Within a hundred years, most of these tribes started disappearing. By the 1700s of Florida, 300 years ago, 
most all of these were gone. The very few that survived, some of the Appalachian, mixed in with the Spanish and other tribes in Louisiana. The Tamuqua mixed in with other tribes coming here, and also the Spanish in St. Augustine. Some of them went to the islands like the Bahamas. Um, but many tribes started coming to this empty land after these tribes died away from disease. It was empty, and the Spanish needed help, and so tribes out of Georgia getting tired of the trade they're getting with the English, they start coming down here. One of the earliest villages was north of here, Alachua Prairie. It was the site of Chief Cowkeeper's village. He was one of the, um, the earlier Seminole chiefs. Now this migration of tribes and runaway African slaves escaping slavery, coming to Spanish Florida, they could live free. And that word Cimarron probably came from the Spanish word applied to these people, mixture of tribes, runaway slaves, the Cimarrones, the wild people, or the runaways, or the free people, and that's where the word Seminole came from. And they were a mixture of lots of tribes, old tribes, new tribes, runaway slaves. And by their time, they were no longer living off the land like this. As early Europeans came, they brought their things. And as we saw their things, we liked their things. Who wants to use a rock for a knife when you can use a piece of metal? Who wants to wear a deer skin when you can have fine cloth? Who wants to use a clay cooking pot that breaks easy when you can have a metal one that'll never break at all? And a bow and arrow? It can shoot an arrow clear into the fort from here, but not accurately. But a gun? A gun can shoot a bullet accurate a long ways compared to a bow. And so the accuracy of the gun won out. Now to get these items they have, at first it's our knowledge that they want. They tell us to become guides for them and, and show them our trails, and so we do, and the earlier tribes do this. They want that power, as, as first as the barrier of being scared and our language not being able to understand each other, and then we see their power and their guns and their cannons, and when they're horses, and we're thinking, wow, we gotta get these guys on our side. How many of you folks know where the village of Saloy is? Saloy. Today you call it St. Augustine. It was an Indian village there first, Saloy, and it was there for thousands of years. And as the Tamuqua saw the Spanish come in, they never left, and they stayed. And eventually the tribes got their things, and a lot of those tribes died away from disease, but the new tribes that came down, the Creeks and the Seminoles, uh, they had already been trading for a long time up in with the English, with the French in Alabama, and the Spanish here in Florida. And then they started setting up trading posts along the St. John's River. Patton and Leslie Company bought uh, their trading companies, set up their trade goods. And so, as time went on, these tribes came down. Of course, their clothing has changed a lot. Their weapons have changed a lot. They become known as the Seminole. Their Creek Wars ended about 200 years ago right now. And the refugees of the Creek Wars came into Florida. A young boy named Billy Powell would come down here and he would get his manhood name, Posse Ohola. He was born in Alabama, but when he came and lived here near Silver Springs, he went through his manhood about 16 or 15 years old. And during this time, he would be given the black grain. If you don't know what the black grain is, it's Joe Pond Holly, and it made into a caffeine tea. Um, and our word for tea, say it with me, Asi. In the Creek language means tea. Um, and if you want to see the plant, the monument right there on the other side of the flag, that's a, uh, that is the Aussie, or Yopon Holly, which is famously known as the Black Drain, okay? Um, and no, it doesn't make you throw up all the time. Of course, you have to add stuff to it to do that. Uh, it was actually a beverage that many tribes served for caffeine. The second part of that name, Yohola, say that, Yohola. It means to yell out or sing out or give a warrior's yell. And because on the day of his manhood, he gave the loudest war yell, his name became Osceola. When the United States took over Florida in 1821, um, not long after that, President Andrew Jackson signed the Removal Act. What this said was all tribes east of the Mississippi River are going to be moved off the land and taken out to the western lands. Today we call the land Oklahoma. It's from the Choctaw word for land of the red man, where they were sending many tribes to. And so Osceola spoke out against being moved off the land. We'd already heard about tribes up to the north surrendering and marching out west and, and leaving their lands behind. And to many tribes later in history, that would become known as the Trail of Tears because so many of them died on the routes. The children couldn't make it. Uh, the old people couldn't make it on the long roads to Oklahoma. 
and so they died on the Trail of Tears. When they came for the Seminoles, leaders like Osceola spoke out. They put their war paints on, like I'm wearing today, and they spoke out against this. And so the Indian agent at the fort was named Wiley Thompson, and he decided to put Osceola in the prison for speaking out against being moved off the land. So they threw him here in the prison, and he swore he would always get back at Wiley Thompson for this, but he acted good for a while so he could get out. And then the Seminoles had planned it out, a large attack. The soldiers en route to this fort right here from Tampa, which is Fort Brook, was attacked halfway at the Dade's Massacre, we call that today, Dade's, Dade's Battlefield. And if you want to go to that event, uh, the first Saturday of January at Dade's Battlefield State Park will reenact that as well. That was happening at the same time what we're about to do here was happening. Osceola and his warriors, they laid wait in the woods and as the Indian agent Wally Thompson came out after dinner, they attacked and killed him, shot him 14 times with their bullets, scalped him and carried it back to the Wahoo Swamp where they met the fighters of Dade's command and they had a great party in the Wahoo Swamp. And so that was the start of the Second Seminole War. But there were three Seminole Wars. Actually, to the Seminoles, there was just one long, giant war that never ended. Some of them went so deep into the Everglades to that instead of surrender that they were never captured. The army left them there, and, and the wars kind of went to an end, and they never signed treaties, never surrendered. And the only tribe of the country today that never was defeated like that, right here, the Seminoles and the Miccosukees. And so because of those Seminoles that went in the Everglades, is why we still have natives in Florida today. And so we were very honored to have them here with us today and participating here in this battle. I hope you guys have learned something from my talk today. I didn't get a chance to show you many of the items over there because of the heat and I don't want you to move, but they're self-explanatory. Everything you see over there in a generation replaced everything you see right here. Children no longer used a chip rock, now they had a metal knife. Girls no longer made a clay pot, now they had a metal cooking pot. Our ways have changed. We stopped relying off of nature. We have relied on the white man too much until they got pushed in the Everglades and had to live off of nature again for a while. In 1950s, the United States finally recognized the Seminoles as a tribe. In 1960s, the Miccosukee. So today, uh, we're very honored that the Seminoles and Miccosukee still live in Florida. I would like for you to meet a good friend of mine. He is Seminole, and he's a boat builder. He's gonna to talk to you next, folks. I hope you enjoyed my talk. If you'd like to get photographs or ask some questions, feel free to. We don't clap.